Good morning, everyone. If you could please take your seats and keep your phones muted. Just a little bit of housekeeping as well for our second lecture of the day. Um, the questions will be at the end of the lecture. You will have uh, quite some time to answer the question, uh, to uh, get the answers to your questions, um, but just hold off until we um, get to the end of the lecture. And we won't have any slides for this particular lecture. Um, my, name, my name is Ramina Georgiou Frindrich. I am a retired rheumatologist a third generation geno genocide survivor and president of SAFO Center, which is also known as a Syrian Genocide Research Center, Arizona chapter. Uh, I also serve on community advisory board for GAW at ASU. And I wanna express my deepest gratitude to Rosenbluth Family Charitable Foundation as the sponsor of GAW 10. GAW seeks to confront violent actions and ongoing threats of genocide throughout the world. So we look to the past for guidance for the future. For those of you who may not know, Assyrians are the indigenous people of the Middle East whose empire was known as the cradle of civilization. They have been subject to um, multiple acts of genocide uh, in their ancestral homeland, which, spanned over, which spans over parts of Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. And in fact, uh, just uh, um, Adding on to Dr. Kunz's uh, lecture, uh, just a little bit about the resiliency. Yesterday, we actually celebrated 6,772 years um, of uh, existence on this planet. Uh, the most notable uh, genocide that uh, occurred uh, towards the Assyrians was uh, that of, uh, that was the, the one that was perpetrated by Ottoman Turkey from 1915 to 1923. And about two thirds of the Assyrian population was decimated during that period. My grandparents lost over 20 members of their family. And uh, this is why uh, being part of GAW is partic of particular interest um, to me. And uh, I'm truly blessed and very honored to be here. So our next uh, lecture uh, is actually sponsored also by Assyrian American Cultural Organization of Arizona and Assyrian Student Association of Arizona. And I'm proud to present um, Professor Sabri Atman. Mr. Atman was born in Arbo, uh, Turabdin, uh, which is in southeastern Turkey in the indigenous lands of Assyrians. He moved to Aus Austria due to political reasons and then to Sweden five years later. He received his first master's degree in economics from University of Gothenburg. He also received his second master's degree in human rights and genocide studies from Kingston University in London, University of Siena in Italy, University of Warsaw in Poland, Frankfurt University in Germany as well. His third master's degree is in history from Clark University in Massachusetts. Professor Atman is a founder and director of Assyrian Genocide Research Center and is currently doing his PhD in history at the University of Texas, Dallas. His research and the topic of today's presentation is the impact of declaration of jihad 1914 and the participation of the Kurds in the Assyrian genocide of 1915. So without further ado, ado sorry, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramina, for your warm introduction. Good morning, everybody. It is an honor for me to be here. I want to thank the organizers of this genocide conference and you for allowing me to come and speak about the Assyrian genocide. My name is Sabri Atman, but my real name is Sabro Bengaro. This confusion has to do with the genocide of 1915 in the Ottoman Empire and the Turkifications and assimilation policy of Turkey. Our last names and village and city names were changed to assimilate us. However, they failed. We still exist, we still speak our language and preserve our culture and identity. Before I get started, I would like to ask you, how many of you have met any Assyrians in your life? Wow, a lot. Good. 
In my travels, many people have asked me where I am from. And I always answer that I am a Syrian. And their response is always, wow, you are from Syria and your president is in trouble. I answer them, no, don't worry about my president because I don't have any. And they start to be more confused they say, but you are Syrian. I tell them again, I am not Syrian. I am a Syrian. Then they get even more confused and they ask if Assyrians still exist. I tell them, yes, we exist. And I am one of those approximately 3 million Assyrians scattered around the world. Empire collapsed but people remain. For example, the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore, but Roman people still exist in the form of Italian uh, and Spanish people. Past great empires have collapsed, but the people remain. Here I am, and uh, now you have met another Assyrian. It's nice to meet you all. Today, I will discuss the Assyrian genocide of 1915, the impact of jihad and the involvement of the Kurds. First, I will describe to you, uh, to you the Assyrians briefly. Second, I will talk to you about the, meet, the, the meaning of jihad uh, according uh, to Quran. Uh, the declaration of jihad in the Ottoman Empire in 1915 uh, the German and the Ottoman strategies with the declaration of this jihad. And finally, finally the main uh, topic of my presentation is the prior Ottoman Empire uh, of the Assyrian genocide of 1915, focusing on the impact of Islamic jihad and the involvement of the Kurds on this genocide. The Assyrians are like you said, Dr. Ramina, they are uh, the indigenous people of Mesopotamia and have history uh, back over 6,700 years. And ye yesterday it was the Assyrian New Year. We, over 2,000 people here in Arizona, we celebrated 6,772 years. Wow. Today, the Assyrian are uh, the descendant of ancient Assyrian empire and one of the earliest civilization emerging in Mesopotamia. Uh, today, Assyrians live in the diaspora countries in America, Europe, Australia, Canada, and Russia, and in Ukraine. The remaining Assyrians in their homeland uh, reside primarily in Iraq, Syria, Iran, Lebanon, and Turkey. When we speak about the Holocaust, we need to remember the role of the Christianity and particularly the role of the Catholic and Protestant churches and the trauma that the Germans went through during the First World War. Similarly, when we speak of the Assyrian and Armenian genocide of 1915, we need to remember Islam and the declaration of the jihad 1914. Islam divides societies in two, as Darul Islam and Darul Harb. The common foundation of, for all Islamic concept of war and peace is war view based on this distinction between Darul Islam, uh, which means the home of peace, and Darul Harb. In these kind of societies, the humanization of non-Muslim is a fact. And with, the, with that background, we are ready to discuss jihad. The word jihad is derived from the Arabic verbal uh, root jahd, meaning to strive or uh, struggle usually in the path of God. In Islam, it could be an individual's internal struggle against 
baser instinct, the struggle to build a good Muslim society, or a, a war for the faith against uh, unbelievers. Jihad struggle is a central duty of every Muslim. Muslim theologians have spoken of many things as jihad, the struggle within the soul, defending the faith from criticism, supporting its growth and defense financially, even migration to non-Muslim lands to separate Islam. However, violent jihad is a constant part of Islamic history and a central element of Islamic theology. Many passages of the Quran and Hadith and, say, and saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad are used by jihad fighters today. And in the past uh, to justify their actions and gain, gain new recruits. When studying Islamic history and doctrine violence of jihad can be founded in numerous verses of Quran. Most notably, one known is in Islamic theology is as the verse of, of the sort. I quote, but once the sacred months have passed, kill the polytheists who violated their threats wherever you find them and take them and basic, basic them and prepare for the, them each ambush. But if they repent and establish worship and pay their uh, uh, poor due, then leave the, their way free. Indeed, Allah is forgiving merciful. Surah 9, verses 5 in Quran. The origin of the concept of jihad goes back to the wars fought by the Muslim prophet Muhammad and their written reflection in the Quran. Obviously, the concept was influenced by the ideas of war among the pre-Islamic Northern Arabic tribes. The Quran frequently mentions jihad fighting against the unbelievers. There are many, many passages about jihad in Quran. For example, uh, Surah, in Quran, Surah 2, verses 121, Surah 9, verses 5, Surah 9, uh, verses 29, and more. However, the concept of jihad and the Muslim relationship with non-Muslim is not limited merely to Quran. There are thousands of hadiths that deals about the concept of jihad and the relationship of Muslim and non-Muslims. According to Islam, the legal system describes believers and non-believers in terms of religious and politics according to medieval times. It is accepted as direct natural consequence to dominate the minds by dominating the wealth, the equal opportunity, the equal rights for members of different religions and as citizens. The jihad that was declared by Sheikh al-Islam in November 1414, the highest theological authority in the Ottoman Turkey contained five uh, religious ruling fatwa that called the ma all Muslims to fight, to fight against non uh, intended powers. In addition to this theological authority warned those Muslims who fought on the side of the Islamic rules and would be punished. Thousands of pamphlets which were drafted and printed in Berlin uh, at the intelligence service of Orient, were brought to Constantinople, currently Istanbul. These pamphlets were spread among the population in Constantinople and called them to rise up, fulfill their duty for Allah, 
uh, shortly after all Muslim populations in Anatolia and other areas of the Ottoman authorities received their pamphlets uh, spread from Constantinople, Istanbul. The fatwa declared that war, the war was legal according to Sharia law. Sharia is an Arabic term that means way uh, or path. Sharia is Islam, Islam's legal system. The objective of the declaration of this fatwa was to mobilize uh, the Muslim population. According to the Ottoman Sultan, jihad had become an individual duty uh, and strengthened the people's will to come and together for uh, the sake of Islam. The declaration of this jihad was against all enemies of the Ottoman Empire, except the central powers. That made the Dutch Orientalist Christian uh, Snauk Horgronier announce that the, this declaration of jihad was product, product uh, made in Germany. The role of Germany, the Germany in this declaration should be considered part of their strategy. However, there are several things to consider with this jihad. All these fatwas were drafted by Sheikh al-Islam and signed by uh, 29 uh, religious figures in the Ottoman Empire. Imagine you live in a Muslim society in 1914 and your 29 religious leaders signed a declaration of fatwa. It was kind of an order for the Muslim community living in the Ottoman Empire. Germany had a decisive influence on the Ottoman uh, entrance in the World War I. The German objective was to use Ottomans. Simply, they wanted Muslims to revolt against Britain in India and many other African countries. In his book, or made in Germany, uh, Dutch scholar Horgrunier blames German, Germany and its Orientalists, for example, Siho Bakker for the declaration of jihad made by the Ottoman uh, authorities in 1914. Horgrunier criticized the German Orientalists for undermining the goals of modernizing society and advising German Kaiser Wilhelm uh, II to convince the Ottoman uh, leaders to declare jihad. However, Horgruni asserted that all European powers welcomed the Young Turks movement and wanted to end the medieval mixture of religions and politics. According to Horgruni, there was no space for a caliphate and jihad in such a state because Turks, Greeks, Armenians, and others lived together for centuries and cooperated in liberty, equality, and uh, fraternity. The German jihad strategy, which was developed with the uh, aim during the uh, World War I, was to strike the enemies, British Empire, Russia, and France, from behind diverting the Islamic world into the colonies of enemies, uh, the UK, Russia, and France, through Islamic rewards, dec declaration jihad. This holy war jihad project was the main reason for Germany to become allies with the Ottoman. The Islamic provocation by the Germans was also turned towards Armenians and Greeks with the Ottoman Empire. The German military headquarters uh, carried out the German jihad policies and propaganda in Istanbul together with the news center Nachrichtenstelle, 
established within the German foreign minister. New center, Rachtin Stelle, was publishing pamphlets and propaganda in jihad. Then what was the Ottoman strategy? The Ottoman leaders did not merely obey Germans' will and declare jihad on November 14, 1914. The leadership of the Committee of Union and Progress, COP, declared jihad intending to unite all the Turkish speaking people as a single entity. This was known as pan turanism They want to unite all Turkish speaking countries under one umbrella. This was Turanism. This was the big dream of the Ottoman leaders. Their strategy by declaring jihad was uh, to take a step further towards their Turan idea. Simply, the jihad was a tool in their hands to mobilize the Muslim population and reach their goal. However, part of their dream was by declaring jihad was accomplished and non-Muslim population part participated in the killing of Armenian, Assyrian, and Greek Christians in Anatolia. While Germany's engagement and propaganda to foster jihad amongst the world's Muslims and to raise Muslims to anti-colonial revolts failed rather miserably. Ottoman's concentration focused more on Muslims within the Ottoman boundaries. The declaration of jihad in the Ottoman Empire made Muslim population, Turks and Kurds, participate in the Assyrian, Armenian, and Greek genocide of 1915. The jihad declaration which engaged, encouraged Muslim to loot and kill infidels was read in all uh, empires most. This declaration allowed the Kurds to participate in the, of the, in the extermination of the Assyrian and Armenian Christians in the Eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire. It was halal, permitted, therefore lawful to loot and kill infidels for the Muslim uh, perpetrators. Furthermore, uh, those who killed seven infidels could enter heaven and too many wanted to go to heaven. The Ottomans were more realistic than the Germans. The Ottomans ambitions were more about uniting Ottomans Muslims in a fight against the central powers and homogenizing Anatolia as a country for the Turks than stealing uh, up Muslim uprisings. Muslim strategies to take the Ottoman Empire to their side was to make them declare jihad and break the domains of Great Britain in India. Because India made an enormous contribution to Britain's war effort. However, the German strategy didn't work out for several reasons. The Muslim population did not revolt against Britain. Therefore, many Western and Turkish historians as Murad Bardacci and many in Turkey, whose starting point is based on Germany's strategy, assess that the Jihad declaration as a fiasco. These point of view do not give the whole picture uh, though. Let's start with the Assyrian genocide of 1915 now. The Assyrian genocide, also known as a Seifu, is uh, one of the most overlooked genocide committed during the 20th century. It remains unrecognized internationally. It is known as Seifu, sort in English. The Seifu was used to exterminate the indigenous Assyrian people. The Ottoman Empire committed genocide against the Armenians uh, and Greeks during the First World War, but did not limit itself to Anatolia. Ottoman troops also invited Persia in Urmi, in Iran. The Urmi region of Persia did not have secure borders and was several times occupied by Ottoman Turks, 
Ottoman troops and irregular Kurds killed thousands of Armenians and Assyrians in Urmi. The Assyrian genocide took place at the same time, at the same as the Armenian genocide. It happened in various phases, starting with Urmia, Salamas in northern uh, western Persia, passing through Hakkari in one province and spreading the Diyarbakir, and then to the towns of Mardin, Bitlis, Wan, uh, Midyat, and uh, uh, to an area called today Turabdin. The Turabdin is from the Assyrian language, meaning the mountain of, of a servant of God. The atrocities continue to spread to Botan and many other places, all situated Eastern Anatolia, today uh, Southeastern Turkey. One of the related issues here that needs to be understood is the role of the Kurdish. Uh, uh, they, they are Muslims, the Kurdish tribes, in the Assyrian genocide in uh, the cities of, of Diyarbakir. Turabdin region, how is my time, Dr. Amina? Yeah. Turabdin region and Urmi, uh, what, what were the Kurdish motives and their nature of economic and social relations between Kurds and Assyrians in the pre genocidal period? Such examination provides a better understanding of why the Kurds participated. Furthermore, one must delineate how the local Kurdish attempts to land consolidation were rooted in the growing nationalist discourse, deep-seated tribalism and religious uh, animosities. At, at the beginning of the 20th century, the ideology of the COP, the Committee of Union and Progress, was weak and weak. This ethnic nationalism was behind the Turkification of the multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire. That the master of plan of homogenizing Turkey was carried out during the First World War. For the purpose, non-Turkish Muslims, such as Kurds and Arabs, were deported from the eastern to the western provinces in order to be assimilated. However, the policies of the CUP, Central Committee of Union, uh, toward the Christian population were different. Uh, an anti-Christian uh, campaign was declared against, against all non-Muslim population with the Ottoman Empire. As a result of this policy, the Assyrians, Armenians, and Greeks were targeted groups in the genocide of 1915. Uh, Assyrian genocide survivor uh, Ishaq Armale described a letter to the governor of Diyarbakir, uh, Dr. Rashid, uh, sent to his friend Fezi Bak. The governor presented the ways to achieve his evil purposes against all Christians in the area. He said, I quote, the time has came to rescue Turkey from the domestic enemies, uh, Christians and Jews. We must be clear that the European states will, prote will, prote uh, will not protest us or punish us because Germany is in our side and will help and support us." End of quote. Dr. Reshit was appointed governor of Diyarbakir in 1914 by CUP, which gave him great power to implement his extermination policy towards the Christian population living in the area. The extermination of the Christian population, whether Armenian, Assyrian, or Greek, uh, that followed shortly thereafter showed that the Muslim population concept and message of jihad was taken seriously. Turks and Kurds and other Muslim population from different ethnicity participated largely in the genocide against uh, Christian population. The Muslim population were motivated by declaration of this jihad uh, by this jihad. Uh, for the Muslim population, uh, being Armenian Assyrians did not play any role because all Christians were considered as infidels, according to Abdullah Goke and uh, Gaurian Masud, whom I interviewed 
in Germany 2007. Uh, in the past 20 years, I have interviewed over 250 Assyrian genocide survivors in Europe, in many countries. When I went to them to speak about their experience about the Assyrian genocide, almost 90%, they didn't want to talk to me. And at that time, I couldn't understand why they were not willing to talk to me about their experience. And uh, it took time for me to notice that these people, they were traumatized. You know, the symptom of trauma, people, they don't trust, they don't trust other people. They feel shame, they feel guilty. And one of those people was 107 years, Abdullah Goke living in Germany. And at that time, I was living in the Netherlands. It took 10 minutes for me to go and to say, hello, how is your health? I visited him several times. After several times, one day uh, he called me, he said, what are you doing next week? I said, I have nothing to do. I was, uh, I was waiting for this call. He said, take your camera and come to me. I will talk to you. And normally when you go and uh, speak with uh, any survivors, you prepare your questions and uh, to ask. I went to him, but he didn't allow me to ask questions. He started to ask me questions. He said, tell me, how many eyes do you see here? I said, you have two eyes. He said, in front of these two eyes, they raped my mother. In front of these two eyes, they killed my younger brother. I said, wow. And he started to cry. I was speechless. I paused. When he finished to cry, I said, Uncle Abdullah, but these things even occurred 100 years, 100 years ago. Then his voice changed. He said, for you, it was 100 years ago. But me, for me, it was part of my dream last night. And my question to him was, do you hate this? who did this against to you, who raped your mother, killed your brother, and many others. He said, you know, I am Christian. I can't hate. Also, I am mature enough to know that hate will not help. But the only thing I want in my life to hear from those people to say, we are sorry. We did something bad to you. We feel sorry then I know how to forgive them. Please take me. We were arranging uh, an European conference in the European Parliament. He said, please take me with you. I will speak up and tell them what happened to my family, to my mother, to my uh, brother, to many others. And from there, I went to Australia. When I was in Australia, I heard that he passed away. I went direct to cemetery to show my respect. And when I was there, president, current president of er uh, Turkey, Erdogan was on TV. He said, we are Muslims. Genocide, what is that? We are Muslim, we don't do these things. And still Turkey denied the Armenians, Assyrian and Greek genocide. What we want is justice, recognition. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yeah, and please now. Oh, yeah, please. Is, is there any worldwide pressure on Turkey to acknowledge the genocide? Of course, Armenians. And first of all, in the United States, in Australia, and, and uh, many other places, they are doing great work. They are well organized, and uh, uh, they do a lot for the recognition. 
and sometimes their voice is heard, sometimes not. They are so far what I know, uh, they are, I can be wrong, but around 28 countries that recognize the Armenian genocide. Uh, eight countries has recognized the Assyrian genocide. And uh, there are a few states in the United States uh, that recognize the Assyrian genocide. And thanks to Dr. Ramina and other Assyrian organizations in Arizona, all together, we work that the state of Arizona has recognized the Assyrian genocide 2019. And uh, Armenia has recognized the Assyrian genocide, Sweden, Netherlands, and many others. Uh, but still Turkey denies is a taboo subject in Turkey. And um, uh, they, we hear they deny all the time. And it is a uh, real pressure on Turkey. I don't see because uh, economic and other strategic relationship with Turkey. Uh, so Turkey is still far away from recognizing the Armenian Assyrian genocide. Please. Um, yeah. I have, a, I have a unusual insight to, to, to your research. Um, I have not heard it from. Um, I, I, I do have a question. Um, what is the status, and, and I know that you've mentioned it to us several times, but what is the status of getting your the, those interviews published and, and, and recognized and, and out and out for everyone in the world to hear and see. What is the status of that? Getting those yeah, thank you. Really great question. Yeah, these uh, uh, 200, 300 uh, genocide survivor testimonies that I have, I speak many languages and uh, these, they are in Aramaic, Assyrian, both dialects. We have two dialects, Western, uh, Eastern dialect, Turkish, Kurdish, Arabic, and uh, Hebrew. And, uh, and this, I, I was in contact with Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles, and uh, because there are 52,000 Holocaust survivors' testimonies, they are digitalized. There are about 10,000 uh, uh, Armenian genocide survivors' testimonies there, but uh, as soon as they are not yet there, it's about to get some. It, it will. We need two people to work on them to transcript. It's about financial. Uh, to get some financial support. Uh, they told me about 100,000, 150,000 it will cost to digitalize all this project. Hopefully in the future, they destroy our language, they took our country, homeland and uh, our identity. But I will tell you, they will never uh, be able to destroy our dreams. We keep our dreams for the future. Oh, Professor, and please, yeah. Please go ahead, sir. Um, I have a two. Um, one, one is the relationship between the Assyrian community and Syria, and the other is the number that I always heard was 1.5 million uh, uh, Armenians. Um, are Assyrians in that number, or are Assyrians on top of that number, and what number would that yeah, also a very good question. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, there are some cities in uh, the Ottoman, Kharput, uh, Adiyaman, some other places, Assyrian, they spoke Armenian, the language. It, it's possible, it's impossible for us to know, uh, but it's one, one and a half million Armenians. And if you ask me how many uh, Assyrian they killed uh, during the genocide, to give exact statistic is very difficult. And I can tell you there are some Assyrian, they give the number 750,000, but the document that I have, I did my research in British National Archive. There were Assyrian delegation who went to uh, Paris Peace Conference. They, uh, they presented the number 275,000 Assyrian that they lost. Even if they are 10,000, if they are 10 people because their ethnicity to be killed are too much, but uh, to 275,000, this is according to my research that they lost their life. 
Yeah, Assyria and Syria after the civil war, many uh, Assyrians, they are Christian and they are, for example, a region called Khabur. There were 32 Assyrian villages and ISIS, ISIS took over and Assyrian, they were their villages, people they were killed, kidnapped and people now you can find them in Chicago, in Arizona or in Australia, uh, they are they couldn't defend themselves. They did resistance, but their power was not enough. The number is less. In Turkey, now we have about 20,000 Assyrians living in southeastern Turkey. We have three, four monasteries, churches, some villages, they are Assyrians. Uh, in Iraq, the number is less. After 2014, a genocide, uh, ISIS took over in Iraq. In Iran, the number is much less than before. So we are going through very painful assimilation process in diaspora countries, but still we try to raise awareness about our past. It is not about this genocide is not only against the Assyrians. A genocide, whether it's Holocaust, Armenian genocide, Assyrian genocide, it's crimes against humanity. It's against you too. So to prevent future genocide, future crimes against humanity, uh, these, they should be acknowledged and condemned. And um, this, this is what we are doing to raise awareness about the Assyrian genocide. Professor, yeah. Um, thank you. There's so many questions I have, so I'll try to focus. Um, there hasn't been a lot of thought that there's some thought that this line what German soldiers who would be in the Ottoman Empire as part of the genocidal process learned of what happened in Germany that ended up playing out in the Holocaust. I'm wondering, this particular piece is really important, this mobilization of religion, particularly by leaders who are essentially atheists, um, which was very prominent in the Ottoman Empire. Does that, have you looked at all how that, that sort of gets picked up by, by the Nazis, by Germany? Does it have a role at all in how the Nazis mobilize um, anti-Semitism through Christianity, or is that not the case we're talking about? I did not, it is, the. Um... I, my knowledge is very limited, really, but I hear from here and there, uh, the Nazis, they had their experience from the Armenian genocide. Uh, this is the quote that Hitler also was, 1939 in uh, Poland, uh, when he said, who cares about the Armenian genocide? Let's do it. So encouraged him to do, prepare the Holocaust. So, yeah, please. Um, how does that, how does that um, uh, differentiate the difference between Armenians and Assyrians in Iraq? Um, it, it, they, um, from what individual I know, that that um, work together and, and they spoke highly of each other. Um, there, there was no animosity between them because they were all Christians. Kurds, they are not Christians. Maybe individual, yeah, 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 I know, yeah. I know. yeah. Um, there, there are Kurds that are Christian, but the Kurdish government, but you know, that's different. That, that's where my question is. What, um, how, how do you go about? Uh, um, we talked about you know getting the Turkish government to admit their role. How do you go, go about getting the Kurdish government to get to to admit their role when they're being supported by many other governments in their in their actions against ISIS? Yeah. When you know they're they're on that fence. Yeah, maybe Professor Henry also is uh, uh, is Armenian scholar. Uh, is uh, you are Armenian scholar, right? And uh, and I speak these languages, Kurdish, and I have very good Kurdish friends and uh, other Turkish friends also. And uh, before it was when we spoke Assyrians and Armenians too, when we spoke about the genocide of 1915. Our Kurdish friends, they were saying us, yes, speak up. We are together to speak against the Turkish state. But when we start to speak about their responsibility, then they, we don't want to hear this. And uh, it, is, it looks like the Kurdish organization that I know took the concept of the uh, 
also homogenize Kurdistan and uh, because they can feel like these people in the future will demand their rights and it will be a problem for us. Let's homogenize our Kurdistan. And Kurdistan, the Stan, it's Farsi word, it means the land of the Kurds. But most of these lands belong to Assyrians and um, Armenians too in many cities in Turkey. So Kurds, there are some, they acknowledge also Kurd, Turks, but in majority, they don't want to speak about uh, Kurds. And 99.9% um, uh, .9 of the Kurds, they are Muslim. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, ones, the ones that I had interacted Yeah, with, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and many times that I speak about the Assyrian genocide, I really, I tell my friends, Assyrian too, please never ever generalize people. Uh, when we speak about the genocide, it's not that I speak against the Turkish people, against the Kurdish people. No, I have very good friends, Rajab Maraj living in Berlin. He was in jail for 17 years. They were boiling water and put in his mouth. And while he was sitting in prison, he wrote a book, 350 pages about the Assyrian and Armenian genocide. Because of he is Kurt, how could I blame him? And his wife, the same. So they are good that we have this kind of, uh, sorry, one minute left, wow, <laughs> yeah. Oh, please, Helen, yeah. And both of you, please, I will. Uh, uh, I hear that uh, uh, what I know, Kurds and Turks together, they were forced to convert to Islam. It is not like uh, voluntarily. They... Oh, no, no. But there are about 10,000 uh, Kurds uh, living in Turkey today. Uh, they are Assyrian. They were forced converted to uh, Islam. And we have very good communication with them. They are Muslims, but they are Assyrians. Some of them, now they start to convert to Christianity. Some of them, they are atheists. They are pro to be that. And some of them, they are pro to be Muslim. They are born like that. And the one, and second, please. Oh, and then, yeah, please. And um, when the genocide occurred in 1915, perpetrators started to destroy the leadership, the leaders, more educated people. Uh, and the rest of people, they were like defendless. And uh, for example, my mother, she couldn't write her name. The same with my father, but me, Sabro Bengaro, I speak 13 languages. Uh, I emigrated to Austria, Sweden, and many. I am educated. I have three masters. I'm doing my PhD. And now in Sweden, there are uh, about 10,000 Assyrians in different universities. So we uh, get more knowledge about our history, identity. So we start to speak. But the Armenian diaspora in the United States, there are uh, congressmen, uh, senators, and the writers, scholars, there are 17 chairs in different universities in the United States. They uh, teach about the Armenian history identity. And our number is less than Armenians. And we are here and there. And this is one of the uh, challenges that we have. Uh, but uh, look, we, our number is in Sweden 150,000, and we have six 
member of the in uh, parliament and we made the Swedish government to recognize the Assyrian genocide. And look, uh, if you are here, thanks to you that states of Arizona has recognized the Assyrian genocide. There are many other challenges that our number is less. And the people also can't uh, government, uh, we don't have country behind us. So they don't have interest. They listen to us. It's a, but why should we help you? It's kind of interest. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.